All right, principle number five, which is nutrition principle number two, eliminate grains. All right, so uh, I didn't know what picture to put up there. So I sometimes take pictures of my meals. It came through kind of dark, but that's a steak with some asparagus. And they served it on a board. So that's, that's what a meal should look like. It's, you know, it's an animal and some vegetables, right? And if you, you're like me, I just need things. Oh, my God, man, I just need it simple. Give me an animal, give me vegetables, right? So that's kind of the way I think about food. I try to keep it as simple as possible rather than to be so complex. Breads, crackers, cereals, noodles. Whether they're whole wheat or not, right? Whether they're whole grain or not, get rid of that stuff. If it comes in a bag or a box, it's bad. Uh, the, the thing that I see it, I, I can't believe how many people I see that claim to know about a low carb diets and stuff that still eat, eat oatmeal, right? And, um, and they read our handouts and they do all that stuff and they hear me talk and maybe they've come to see me 10 times and they've heard the speeches over and over again. And their weight loss comes to a stop, and I say, what do you, what, what do you, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And then when I said, well, what did you have for breakfast? Oatmeal. <laughs> okay. Oats are, <laughs> oats are a giant hoax, all right? People are making money off of you selling you oats, but they're not meant for human consumption, so don't eat them, all right? Just remember that it doesn't have to be wheat to be a grain. Just because it has all that other seeds on the outside of the bread and all that other stuff and there's different types of grain, it's all grain. And human beings really weren't meant to consume this sort of thing, okay? So it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, promote weight gain through insulin and it probably has an inflammatory effect on a lot of people when they eat it. It's not really the same as the kind of stuff that human beings may have been eating thousands of years ago anyway. So uh, I just tell people, look, get it out of your diet. So if you can get rid of the sugar first, you've really accomplished something. And from my standpoint, from a public health standpoint, if that's all I ever get people to do, then I've really accomplished something. If I can get them to eliminate the grain second, whew, man, I'm in good territory now, all right? The third thing is if I can get them to eliminate starches, all right? So the rice and potatoes, beans, things like that. You can see the french fries there. A lot of people don't think of that as a starch. They say, oh yeah, potato. I think of baked potato as a starch, you know. Well, the french fries count too. <laughs> you know, you, you could fry that seafood. And, uh, you know, you, you can use almond flour. You can use crushed up pork rinds. This stuff's good. It's good that way. It's better with the, than with the white flour, I'm telling you. All right, so I just want to touch on a few behavioral things. By the way, I just give a good report see, about fried seafood. So I've got a house. I've got, I got a, a small beach house at Oak Island, which is right where the eye of the hurricane hit. And I didn't have a single bit of damage. All right? I didn't have a single bit of damage. So I've been through three hurricanes now with that house, and I've not had a bit of damage so far. And I'm, I'm, I'm not planning on having any. So, but I'll let Casey talk about the mindset when it's, it's her, her turn to talk. I think she's going to talk about mindset. I never believed I was going to get any damage. All right. So planning and preparing, right? So I put a picture up there. That picture, that was the Washington, D.C. Post, historic post office. And several years ago, uh, it was designated a National Historic Landmark and it was leased out with a lot of restrictions on what you could do to it. And an individual leased it for 200 years to turn into a hotel, but you couldn't just make it like a typical hotel because you couldn't just do whatever you wanted to it. So our current president, before he ran for president, was the one who leased it. And so it's a totally different kind of hotel. And uh, so all of the features of the post office basically dressed up are still there. All the offices that the people worked in there are now hotel rooms. But it's basically in the same condition with the same elevators and all of that sort of thing. And um, 
it exemplifies that human beings are used to planning and preparing. Do you think that they, that his company took that project on without a plan? Right. You see, we're used to doing this in life. There's nobody in here who owns a home who didn't go through that process of, you know, oh, I've got to apply for the mortgage. Or, unless someone in here won the lottery and they just went down and wrote the check. But the, uh, you know, you, you plan and prepare for all these events in life. But it's funny, when I talk to patients, you know, that they really don't, in many cases, use those same sort of thinking skills when it comes to eating and what they're going to eat, right? And so when you're on a ketogenic diet, you, get, you, gotta, you gotta plan and prepare. So I talked about the holidays, right? So, um, my, my wife's family, she's not here so I can talk about them. The, uh, <laughs> I mean, they like all sorts of sugary things and all that, and they're very traditional about Christmas, for example. And, and I have to, they're my next door neighbor, so I have to go over there and do all this stuff. But, you know, uh, I, I, I don't just, I always eat before I go over there, okay? And I take stuff that I can eat over there, okay? Because otherwise, what's going to happen? I, I go over there, and if I'm hungry, and all this stuff's around, and they have all this addictive food, and they're laying it out in front of me, and they're all eating it and so forth. Am I more likely to relapse and do something that's not right? Sure, absolutely. So uh, it's, it's, it sounds very simple, but a lot of people miss this point. So uh, this is something you should really pay close attention to, and you should think ahead, and you should plan and prepare for the scenarios you're going to be in. And uh, I even do this like, you know, I could tell you driving today over here, I know in my head all the places that I could stop and get something if I got hungry that did not have, uh, that was not laden with carbohydrate, acceptable things to eat. And so um, that's kind of the way that I've learned to think about that sort of thing. I know week to week, okay, these are the kind of things that I need from the grocery store to carry on my week with the kind of schedule I have, taking the things that I need to work, for example. Uh, many people haven't gone there in their mindset, and I think that it's important that you start to learn to think like that. That you, that you plan and prepare for the way your life is and how am I going to eat a carbohydrate restricted diet in my life? How do I need to prepare for that? Do I need to take things with me? Do I need to go and buy this stuff at the store ahead of time? Do I need to prepare it and put it in Tupperwares? If I'm going to stop somewhere, where's it going to be and what am I going to get? So I know a lot of menus in my head. So, because I have to. I just don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to Make, make mistakes over and over again. All right. Write it down. Write down what you do. If you, if you actually just start, you won't have to do this very long, but if you're writing down what you do, you'll see it. It'll convict you if you're doing it wrong, and it will reinforce what you're doing if you're doing it right. Um, another principle that Yeah, the guy was the head of the FDA. He wrote a New York Times bestseller about uh, the end of overeating. I can't recall his name off the top of my head now. David Kessler. Yeah, David Kessler. There you go. So David always said that he would actually, David would, um, he would actually do short little rehearsals of the scenarios because he had to go all these different functions as the head of the FDA. And they always had all this bad stuff there. So he would rehearse in his mind how he was going to look, what the food was going to be, and what he was going to do. And he found that really kept him on track. I think, I think it's really valuable to do things like that. It doesn't take very long to do them. All right, so principle eight, accountability and feedback. You start writing things down, you start doing those short rehearsals, and then pair it with anything that gives you feedback on what you're doing, such as a scale, a blood pressure cuff, um, uh, tape measurements. There's all sorts of things. Body fat. Uh, uh, there's different devices you can use to check your body fat now. Most people who come to see me don't want to weigh on a regular basis. They're scared of what it's going to say. This has been their relationship with, say, scales or, or whatever, the body fat percentages or whatever they are. And I just say, well, you've got to turn that on its head because there's a, there's a flip side of that coin, which is if I'm doing what's right, those things are going to say very positive things about me, and they're going to encourage me to continue to do what's right. Okay, so just looking at it a different uh, If you can get other people, I like groups like this, right? Christians are smart enough to know that, hey, let's gather at a church. We'll encourage one another, right? 
Yeah, so we, you want to get around people who are dieting the same way, doing the same sorts of things you were doing. Team up with people like that. It helps you stay on track. And then look, on mindset, don't be negative. One of the things I always tell my patients is, you're never going to get a positive result thinking negative thoughts and saying negative things. All right? So you might as well, instead of saying, I can't do this, I can't possibly cut this out of my diet because I'm Italian, you might as well say, yeah, I can. <laughs> Hell yes, I can. Okay? I guarantee you if someone was paying you a million bucks a day to do it, you could do it. Okay, and they look at me and say, really, someone would do that? I said, well, if they did, could you do it? And they'd say, yeah. And I said, see, you have the ability. You just, all you need is the donor now. All right. Now, the other thing is plan for setbacks. If you, if you have setbacks, well, you know what? Don't wallow around in the ditch, I always say. Get right back up so you're human. Forgive yourself. Get out of that condemnation mode. Get up out of the ditch. Get back on the wagon and get moving again, okay? There's no need uh, just beating yourself up over it. All right. When you're on a ketogenic diet, you don't need as much food as you think. But there's damage. There's damage to the weight regulation center in your brain. And so it takes you longer to sense the correct sense of satiety and fullness. So the one thing I would tell you to do is when you eat this diet, go slowly and then pause and wait. It'll take you 15 to 30 minutes for the sensation of the correct sensation of satiety to catch up with you. So it takes me a long time to eat in the evening. I mean, I might eat two spoons of pimento cheese, get up from the table, and go do something else. Go start the laundry, for example, okay? Get that going. I actually do laundry. So the, uh, you know, or do some job and then, and then come back in 15 to 20 minutes. Am I, am I still really hungry? Now, if I'm hungry, eat some more. But a lot of times you'll find at that point you're not nearly as hungry as you think. So a lot of people have been conditioned to eat too fast and then they eat too much. And um, you just don't need to do it. You, if you'll just take your time. See, Barney there, he's my little Yorkie. You see? Now, he doesn't need to eat that whole plate of fried seafood. I mean, he doesn't need all that. Now, he, he, he'd do it if you let him, okay? But you just have to, you have, to, you have to really practice this, and you'll find it takes a whole lot less food than you think. I'll put one other note on there about variety at the end. I'll tell you something about variety. A lot of people say, hey, I get tired of doing this, this, eating this way. I miss this, that, and the other. And then I always say, do you think variety is a good thing? Look at the history of human beings. All right? Did our ancestors have all this variety in their diet? Right. How many of you uh, are trying out this, all this variety in your marriage? How's that working out? Okay? All right? Okay. So I, I, you know, I, I think you ought to examine that. Why do you want all this variety? Okay, maybe it's not such a good thing, all right? Maybe the less variety you have, I'm not suggesting you purposely go out and eat things that taste bad, but if it's all about the pleasure sensation from eating the things that taste good, does it make you overeat? Should you be getting pleasure from other things? Yeah, okay. Uh, I do prescribe medications to people. Not all my patients take medications, but... Um, if your sense of hunger, your sense of satiety, all that sort of thing is out of whack and you have a hard time losing weight because the amount of food that you eat is too much, these things will help. They'll help people who say, I'm having a hard time doing this ketogenic diet. So those things are there. They can help. I'm not going to make a big deal about them, but they're available. We, we do prescribe them at my office. Now, a few bonus points. Um, whoa. Okay. I forgot what my first, first bonus point. We already talked about it. Exercise, right? Exercise is good for your health. Don't make it your weight loss strategy. Okay? That's my main point there. I always say Jesus walked everywhere. He didn't join a YMCA. And so, um, you know, it's okay to be physically active, but, you know, if you think that you're going to, 
you know, uh, if you think you're going to exercise your way to a lower weight, it's probably not going to work. And by, and by the way, in that regard, real high intensity exercise. One of the manifestations of the disease of obesity is when you do this intense exercise, the actual, your body's actual response to it is totally polar opposite than that, say, of a conditioned athlete, where that person's metabolism may go up. The person that has excess body fat, their metabolism actually goes down and they have a stress response to it, right? So there's these compensatory mechanisms that are abnormal. And so I try to tell patients, don't do the boot camp class. Don't do it, okay? This might actually make you gain weight and you'll be really mad and then it's probably gonna make you quit. Yeah, quit, quit trying to do the correct lifestyle. All right, I've already mentioned the finish line is the grave. It's not something you do for a little, you know, 90 days or six months or whatever. All right, you want to wrap your mind around the fact this is the deal. I'm in it for the long haul, okay? Uh, because the diabetes and all that other stuff, it's still out there. It's going to be there as long as you live in this country. If you want to be a missionary in the Philippines with no car in a really rural area, well, that's a different story. But as long as you live here, you, you really have to look at it that way. I've got to do this to the end. And then the final bonus point is addiction is addiction. Okay? So when we think about a drug addiction or a gambling addiction or a sex addiction, you know, the, those things all really are triggering, triggering the same area in your brain. And this is what happens with food. It's triggering these same areas. So, you know, you have to realize that's what's going on. And you don't want to trade one addiction for the other. And this is the, the key to the whole thing. So you don't, wanna, you don't wanna give up sugar and start gambling, all right? Or excessively shopping and, you know, and get these high credit card bills. The, the ticket to the whole thing, in my opinion, is when you give that stuff up, is you have to have positive addictions. You have to have addictions to things that actually put something positive in your life. All right, so one of the things I found was golf. I didn't play, I didn't ever play golf. And uh, I found that if I went out at supper time, once I discovered this, and hit balls into a net or went over to a driving range or over to a golf course, my mind was totally preoccupied with that. It was an endorphin release like you wouldn't believe. I could care less about food, all right? Now, I get some exercise during the process, all right? I don't eat the things that were bad for me that I used to eat, and boom. You know, I've replaced a negative thing for my body with a positive thing for my body. And when you can do that, then you've really got a hold of something. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. And I think we got a question and answer session now, is that right? <laughs>